In a moment, Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy announced Democratic presidential candidate faces the fourth estate as Monitor picks up the audio line of TV's Meet the Press. But right now, some music to sharpen pencils by as we hear Kenyon Hopkins and uh, his treatment of the ditty titled Penny Serenade. Now, here's the moderator, Press, Ned. Welcome once again to Meet the Press. And now seated around the press table, ready to interview Senator Kennedy, are Richard Wilson of the Coles Publications, John Steele of Time and Life magazines, James Reston of the New York Times, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. Now, Senator Kennedy, if you're ready, we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Senator, in the announcement of your candidacy yesterday, you said this. I believe that the Democratic Party has an historic function to perform in the winning of the 1960 elections comparable to its role in 1932. Could you tell us more precisely what you mean by that? Well, I think that the election of 32 was extremely essential because it, uh, I think, helped save the private enterprise system in this country, and I think also it contributed to the saving of uh, democracy. Now, I think in the 1960s, the issue is not democracy here at home or the private enterprise system, but I think it is around the world. I think the United States is the leader of the free world. It has a great role to play. I don't think it's been playing that role in the 50s, and therefore I think the Democratic Party has an historic function in the 60 election. Well, don't you think, uh, Senator, that the Republicans are sure to run on peace and prosperity? And since we are at peace and the nation is prosperous, can they be beaten on those issues? Yes, I think they can be beaten. I think really the problem of the Democratic Party is to attempt to bring home to the people the kind of problems that we're going to face in the 60s, and also to bring home to the American people that we haven't really faced these problems in the 1950s. When Mr. Eisenhower leaves office in 1960, we're going to be faced, the next incumbent, with overwhelming problems. We are going to be faced with a missile gap, which will make the difficulties of negotiating with the Soviet Union and the Chinese in the 60s extremely difficult. When Mr. Coolidge left the White House in 1928, uh, he was uh, hailed. He was an extremely popular chief executive. I don't think he was popular in 1930. Mr. Reston. Uh, Senator, what do you do on this vice presidential question if there is a conflict between what is clearly in your personal interests and uh, the interests of your party? What, what about party allegiance on the vice presidential question? Yes, well, I think I have an obligation to the Democratic Party. Well, what do you do if it is the judgment of your party uh, that you should accept the vice presidency? Well, I'm not going to accept the vice presidential nomination. I shall support the Democratic ticket. I'll work hard for it. Uh, but uh, looking at the hi history of the last 60 years, I don't recall a single case where a vice presidential candidate contributed an electoral vote. I think Dewey lost California in 1948 with Mr. Warren at the height of his popularity as vice president. I know Wendell Wilkie lost Oregon in, in uh, 1940 with uh, Charles McNary, the most popular political figure in the history of Oregon. A vice presidential candidate does not contribute. People vote for the presidential candidates on both sides. That's what's going to happen in 1960. They presume that the, the presidential candidate is going to have a normal life expectancy. They don't say, we don't like the presidential candidate, but we'll vote for the vice presidential candidate. If I can contribute the kind of strength that you might suggest by that question, possibly, I think that perhaps I should be nominated. If I cannot contribute it as nominee, then I believe that I can best serve the party and the country uh, in the Senate, and I can serve what I prefer doing. I don't want to spend the next eight years, as I said yesterday, presiding over the Senate rarely, as Mr. Nixon has rarely done, voting in the case of ties on the very rarest occasions, because they rarely occur, and waiting for the president to die. Unfortunately, in the Constitution, that was all the authority that the vice president was given. But didn't you argue precisely the opposite way in 1956 when yeah. you sought the vice presidency? Didn't you argue that 
you would add greatly to the strength of your party if they would give you the vice presidency? Well, the, nine, the situation in 1956 is somewhat different, uh, Mr. Reston, than it is in 1960. I don't think that Mr. Nixon would accept the vice presidential nomination in 1960 for his party. I haven't heard it suggested that Mr. Johnson, Mr. Humphrey, uh, Mr. Symington uh, accept the vice presidential nomination. I think that all make it quite clear that they would not. Now, uh, I'm making it clear that I will not, but I'll, I'll work extremely hard for the party. And in 1956, when I was defeated for the vice presidential nomination, I think I probably spoke in more states for the party than uh, any other uh, Democrat, and I'll do so again. Mr. Steele. Senator Kennedy, you've defined the job of the, of the vice president as that of breaking ties and watching the president's health. Does that mean that if you are the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party, you'll select the throttle bottom as your vice presidential running mate? No, I'll select the best man I could get if, I, if my uh, life expectancy was not uh, what I hope it will be. But that really is not, I wouldn't think, an enviable prospect for the second man whose only opportunity to exert influence on the course of events would be if, uh, my, if I should die. Well, well, now, will your refusal to accept the vice presidential nomination pertain if, by chance, you are defeated as the presidential nominee with no reference to the religious issue whatsoever? For instance, if the convention chooses Governor Stevenson or Senator Johnson or somebody else, will you still refuse a request that you uh, accept the vice presidential nomination? Yes, I don't think the request will be made because I've made it so clear, and now I hope that uh, I will not run. Well, Senator, on this line, uh, there are a good many people who want to be vice president. I wanted to be in 1956, and therefore, uh, and, they're, and they're very able men. I think would make excellent uh, presidents if the call came, and, and I think they should be given the opportunity. Senator uh, Richard Nixon, who more or less has built his reputation as a vice president and as a stand-in at times for the president with a great deal of responsibility, is known pretty widely as a rough, tough, gut fighter as a campaigner. What makes you think you can beat him? Well, I uh, have no uh, doubt that I can beat uh, Mr. Nixon. For what reason? I have uh, run for election on five occasions, and I've been uh, successful. And uh, I just have confidence that I can beat Mr. Well, Nixon. What, what I don't think the test is, well, a rough, tough gut fighter is who well, we're going to pick for president of the United States, I hope. Well, what kind of a campaign would you run against him? I would run a campaign which attempted to show what I think the responsibilities of the United States are in the 1960s, why I think the Democratic Party, and if I were the nominee as the Democratic nominee's candidate, why I think that I could do a better job than Mr. Nixon could do. I think Mr. Nixon is a formidable candidate. I think who's ever nominated will have a difficult fight with him. I personally happen to believe that I can defeat Mr. Nixon, but I think it will be a very, uh, but I don't think it's going to be uh, who's the toughest gut fighter? Mr. Wilson. Uh, Senator, I'd, I'd like to ask just one question on this vice presidency and then move to something else. Uh, is, not, is it not a fact that the circumstances this year may be somewhat different than they have been previously with respect to the vice president? I refer to the common statement made among politicians that you as a Roman Catholic might suffer some difficulty as uh, a candidate for president, as Alfred E. Smith did, but that as vice president, you would add a great deal to the ticket. Now, uh, are, isn't that a different set of circumstances than previously existed, and what is your reaction to it? Well, Mr. Wilson, I would be extremely sorry if, that, uh, if they said, uh, we won't take Kennedy because he's a Catholic, but we want him because he's a uh, Catholic for vice president. If, if, we, if we make the determination both of those determinations on the grounds of my religion. Regardless of any other factors, I would think that uh, the Democratic Party would not deserve to be successful because you would be giving an office to a candidate who potentially could be the president in either case and uh, who only claim under those conditions would be that he happened to go to church on Sunday to the Catholic Church. I must say I would consider that at a most crucial time in the life of this country to be a, a disastrous way of picking a ticket. And one of the ways that I hope to make it clear that I will not participate is by making it extremely clear that I'm not going to run for vice president. If the Democratic Party feels that I could be a successful candidate and a uh, useful president, 
I hope they'll pick me. If they don't, I'll work for the party, but I would not uh, engage in the kind of operation which might be suggested in the question of attempting to attract Catholics to a ticket because I happen to be on it as vice president. I must say any Catholic who voted for me on those grounds would be extremely unwise, and I would not run. Uh, let me move into the primary uh, situation. Uh, you are a little bit uh, cagey in your announcement about whether you'll enter any primary except that in New Hampshire, where you can, where it's e it's conceded that you probably easily could win. Uh, why are you so uh, doubtful about going into Wisconsin, where you might lose? Well, I'm not uh, doubtful about. Uh, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm going to make a judgment on Wisconsin and other primaries. There are a good many primaries about which I want to make a decision. It's rather difficult, and I want to make the decisions at the same time. Now, there are at least ten primaries uh, which I could enter, Wisconsin one of them. And I'll get, uh, make a final judgment in the next four weeks. There'll be no doubt. There'll be plenty of time for me to file. Well, you and Senator Humphrey are the only pe two people who are talking about entering primaries. Uh, if there is merely a contest between to you two people, which I don't underrate uh, in any sense, uh, but if you two are the only ones who have a contest, isn't there a likelihood that the delegates will say, well, Kennedy won in New Hampshire, uh, Humphrey made a good showing in Wisconsin, what of it? Uh, let's, let's turn to the real questions of this nomination, uh, and the nominating primaries really don't mean anything. Aren't you uh, really uh, heading for that kind of a problem? No, I'm not, because if, if, I, if, if I just ran in New Hampshire, and he just ran in Wisconsin, and he was uncontested in Wisconsin, it might very well have that result. But I don't predict that that will be the final result. No, what I'm saying is that there will be just the two of you in these primaries. Yes, running against each other running in some primaries. Running against each other. In some places, uh, one of you will do pretty well. In some places, I assume, the other will do uh, fairly well. Uh, doesn't, do, do, doesn't the whole thing tend to uh, uh, play down the primaries as an important factor well, because now, there are not enough people in the primaries to make any difference. If Senator Humphrey is willing to run in representative primaries, I am going to run in representative primaries. I'm confident Senator Humphrey and I will be running against each other in one or two or more primaries. If no other candidate will enter the primaries, if Senator Symington or Senator Johnson or whoever might want to be a candidate will not enter any primary, and Senator Humphrey and I run in the primary, Senator Humphrey beats me in the primaries, and the others won't run in the primary, then I think Senator Humphrey's candidacy should be taken extremely seriously. And if the reverse result comes, and I beat Senator Humphrey in the primaries which we engage in, and the other candidates will not submit their name, and plan not to make any announcement till the primaries are over in order to avoid primary contests, then as a Democratic delegate, I would not take that candidacy seriously. That, in other words, what is, if it came down to the point where you were not about to get the nomination, you'd give Humphrey first consideration. Mm -hmm. Senator Humphrey, Humphrey beat primaries. me in the primaries, and yeah. no other candidate goes in. In my judgment, Senator Humphrey deserves well of the convention, because he is at least putting his standing on the line. And I'm going to put mine on the line. Now, some candidate who will not face us in primaries and then uh, hopes to uh, be the choice of, if he can't beat us, he can't beat Mr. Nixon in November. Then you might throw your support to Humphrey in that case. I would think that if Senator Humphrey is prepared to win, that he should receive a good deal of recognition, because if he beats me and no one else will run against him, I would say he would certainly be on the ticket. Mr. Spivak, that Kennedy. is not the result I predict. <laughs> Senator. Senator Kennedy, is there any reason why you might not enter uh, the Wisconsin primary? I know of no reason uh, why I might not <laughs> enter that or many other primaries. Well, why wouldn't you? You've announced that you were going to enter New Hampshire. Why wouldn't you announce that you were going to enter Wisconsin? Well, when the filing date for the various primaries that I'm going to run in comes, I'll announce. And I'll make it very clear, and I hope in the next four or five weeks. But there are a good many primaries, Ohio, California, Indiana, Nebraska, Florida, Pennsylvania, Illinois. I can't run in all of them. Senator Humphrey is really running in the District of Columbia and in Wisconsin and South Dakota, which adjoin his state. 
Now, if he accepted a challenge of yours to run in New Hampshire, would you definitely accept a challenge of his to run in Wisconsin? Oh, of course I'd be extremely interested in that, uh, but it may not even be necessary for him I'm to I'm talking to New about Hampshire. interest. I mean, would you accept that challenge to run in both states? Oh, I'd be delighted, but I don't... I'm not... Let Senator Humphrey decide where he's going to run. I'm going to decide, but I'll tell you, Mr. Spivak, that I, that I have no doubt that Senator Humphrey and I will run in two or three primaries against each other. Now, you've criticized the favorite son device in primaries as mm -hmm. a political maneuver to stifle expression of a popular choice for the presidential nomination. And since you feel that way, uh, will you, if necessary, uh, challenge uh, Governor Brown in California, for example, and DeSalle in Ohio? I uh, have no inhibitions against running any, against a favorite son. <clears throat> I don't know whether I'm going to run in California. If you could take California, wouldn't you run there? I'd cons I'm going to consider California and others. I don't mean to be uh, at all, uh, I, though I appear to be, it's only that I haven't really made a determination because there are at least 15 major primaries and I can't run in all of them. What I'm attempting to do is secure a primary or two where I will have a contest and where it would be fair for other candidates to enter. Then I'm going to enter them. Well, if you took California, that, would, that might very well determine the whole thing wouldn't it? Yes, it might, very well. Then you, you definitely have not decided yet not to go into California. No, I haven't. Mr. Reston. Uh, Senator, I'm very interested in the questions that have been uh, put to you here, and I think they illustrate a point that you were making earlier. They all deal with the tactics of politics. How can you get this question down to a real discussion of the issues of, that are going to face the country in 1960. Well, you know, Madame de Stael once said that politics is proper names. There's no doubt that uh, we're all more interested in discussing tactics, those of us in this profession, than perhaps we are the uh, issues. But I would, uh, and I think that probably in a democratic primary where the candidates are believers in the party, that it's more difficult to get a uh, debate on issues. But at least, uh, as we have five or six uh, serious candidates for the nomination, I would think that their qualifications and their views are, are going to be uh, very well explored in the next six months by the press, and uh, I hope that they'll put them forward themselves. That's why, I, as I said yesterday, I thought in many ways Mr. Rockefeller's withdrawal was a disservice to Mr. Nixon. He doesn't have an opportunity to, to demonstrate his views as, in his interesting a form as he would if he were contesting with Rockefeller. How do you, how do you distinguish between uh, your image of the, of the issues of the 60s at the present time and the president's? You've been making critical statements about the president uh, over the last three or four months. Many of the rest of us have been doing the same thing. And yet, I suppose it's fair to say that the the popularity of the president is as great, if not greater now, than ever before. How do you explain this? Well, I think he has an extraordinary personality, President. I think he's had extremely, on the whole, good times. I think that many of the problems uh, which I think are underground are really a subterranean and have not become obvious yet and will become obvious in the 60s. There are many differences. I'm, I don't make the comparison between Mr. Coolidge and Mr. Eisenhower, but it is a fact that Mr. Coolidge ended in a blaze of glory, too, which was, I think, probably unparalleled until Eisenhower. So that it doesn't really mean that because a president is popular or a politician is popular that he's doing the job fully. Now, I have some criticisms of Mr. Eisenhower, even though he is an exceptional pu public figure. One of them is his failure to maintain a uh, military strength comparable to that of the Soviet Union. He is not going to get a hard and fast agreement on Berlin before he ceases to be president. The second conference will be October. I would think that uh, they would not come to any final conclusion. The next president is going to be faced with the problem of Berlin at a time when the military advantage of the Soviet Union is more obvious than it is today. Secondly, in the other area, in the field of, for example, India, in spite of the fact that the president had a successful trip to India, there is no indication that this administration is going to associate itself with a determined effort to assist India to make an economic breakthrough. The makeup of the World Bank mission 
which I was extremely interested in, as it had some connection with our Senate resolution, indicates uh, that uh, Mr. Anderson, the Secretary of Treasury, and a, uh, who has a very narrow viewpoint, I think, of the potential of the American economy, is dominant in the American cabinet. I think the president is going to uh, escape uh, all of the, that the pigeons are coming home on the next president. I would say he will have the most difficult time next to Mr. Hoover because I think that we're, go, we're due to have a recession. Many economists tell us in 1961 more serious than the 58 recession. All these problems are coming to a climax in 61. Mr. Steele. Senator, talking about India, Margaret Sanger, uh, writing today in the letters column of the New York Times, says that the Indian government has asked the United States six times to furnish uh, assistance in connection with India's birth control problem, which is costing the government in, of India $10, mil $10 million over five years. If you were president, how would you respond to such a request? Well, now, to the best of my information, I've never heard that these official requests have been made by the Indian government. My information is to the contrary. I would say to the Indian government that the United States should engage, will engage in a program, I would hope, of more substantial economic assistance. Mr. Nehru himself has said that if the Indians are given the assistance which they require from the United States and other Western countries, that they can handle the problem themselves. Therefore, it seems to me that rather than attempt to associate this with a foreign aid bill, which has a very difficult time in the Congress anyway, which has many opponents, you will get neither birth control, I would say to Ms. Sanger, nor foreign aid if you attempt to try to put a bill through the Congress with this proviso written into it. I would think the solution for the Margaret Sanger and others would be to support a strong foreign aid bill and let those countries then make their own judgment. And I would say that also to the opponents of Ms. Sanger, that they are morally committed to support such a program, too. Senator, uh, you raised this issue yourself at Beloit College some months ago when you said that the Indian population growth threatened to outstride its economic development. It does. Uh, 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 therefore, uh, supposing the Indian government did ask for this assistance, what, what would your answer be? What I would think that, I hope I've given the answer, I think that the best solution is for the United States to give the Indians substantial economic assistance. I said at Beloit College that the solution uh, was for the United States and other powers to help them get ahead of their population increase. If they make a judgment they want to limit their population under those conditions, that's a judgment they should make. And economic assistance that we give permits them to make that judgment if that's their choice. Senator, getting back to tactics for a moment, I understand that you had people taking polls in Wisconsin last, as late as last Wednesday. I wonder if you could tell us what they found. Was there any slippage in your strength that makes you doubtful about going into Wisconsin? No, I don't know about the poll of last Wednesday. That I don't know about. I've had polls taken in Wisconsin. I've had them taken in other states. I think it's going along rather well. Mr. Wilson. Senator, you may recall that in 1952, there was a rather substantial discussion about the financial resources of the various candidates for president, particularly and vice president, particularly Mr. Nixon, Mr. Eisenhower, and I think uh, Governor Stevenson also made some kind of a financial disclosure. Uh, you and your family are reputed to be quite well to do. Uh, I wonder if you plan to make any such disclosure or if you're willing to make any such disclosure here. Well, I own, no financial I own no stocks. You own no stocks. I own no stocks. Your family owns <clears throat> a considerable amount of stocks, I assume. I would think some, but now I would don't know about the word considerable. But they own, uh, s uh, they own some stocks, that's right. Uh, are you willing to state uh, how much money you're spending on the primary campaign, the pre-convention campaign, I should say? Well, I think beginning yesterday, I'm uh, subject to uh, reporting under the law, and I will make that report. I will uh, uh, spend within what is permitted within the law. I will have to require support. Uh, the expended money will have to come from contributions. Right. Senator, I Judge, can't spend it myself other than the contribution you're permitted to give yourself under the law, which is what, the five point, or ten thousand yeah. dollars? Well, the point is, do you plan to make any financial disclosure as a candidate? Well, Mr. Wilson, you're the first one who's asked me, and uh, I don't know what information you want. I don't have any stocks and bonds. I have no properties which are involved in any way with the government. And uh, But if it bec becomes in the public interest, I'll certainly be glad to take somebody through my books. Senator, Mr. Senator, 
Senator, let me ask you the philosophic part of that question. Do you think that money gives to a rich man an unfair advantage in seeking the presidency? I don't think so. I think that uh, it, uh, there's a uh, belief that there it does, but any candidate who attempts to finance his own campaign will end up in, the, uh, in jail because it's against the law. He's as obliged to, to uh, raise money as is anyone else. His contacts may be broader, but uh, my judgment has been uh, that, that no candidate has failed because of lack of funds in any election, at least, that I have seen. Any serious candidate for the presidency, I think, can raise sufficient funds to carry his campaign through. Mr. Wilson. Governor Stevenson, Mr. Roosevelt, and all the rest raised uh, money successfully. The point this goes to is that Senator Humphrey, in making his announcement, said he didn't have any money to conduct a campaign to speak of, and he was the spokesman of the little fellow who didn't have any spokesman in government. I wondered if he was thinking of you when he... Uh... I don't know who he's thinking of. <laughs> he didn't tell me. I would I say, th Mr. Wilson, that both Mr. Humphrey and I have to raise money. Neither one of us can contribute ourselves Senator, beyond the other uh, shop limitation that we have. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I see that our time is up. And my other thanks to our Meet the Press guest for today, Senator John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts, announced candidate for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States.